I'm John Little of OmegaShack.com, and this is the Weekend Shockcast for Saturday, November 22nd, 2014. We spend a lot of time trying to figure out who and what the beast is, but seemingly very little time looking for the woman who rides the beast. And there are some interesting challenges that we have in trying to figure out the identity of the great whore. The book of Revelation gives us clues to the identity of the great whore, but even though those clues are definitive, they still leave us with more questions than answers. I've tried to answer as many of those questions as possible this week, and the reason why I've tried to do that is wrapped up in a command by God found in Revelation 18. The command is here, quote, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Revelation 18.4 God wasn't making a suggestion. It's a command, and refusing to follow a command like that would be a sin, and I do not think that any of us want to disobey God. The problem is that we aren't completely sure who and what the great whore is. I've chosen what I believe to be the three possibilities that I've heard talked about the most and tried to see how they fit according to the clues that God has left us in Revelation. It's now left to you to decide whether you live in or too close to the mother of harlots. If the answer is yes, you know what to do. So what did we talk about this week? We introduced the subject and the book by John Price, The End of America. We identified the three main theories about the whore and looked at the first verse in Revelation 17. We showed how the beast rider committed fornication with the kings of the earth and made the people drink of that fornication. We looked at her beauty and the luxury of her apparel and we described the remaining clues and tried to reach a conclusion. So let's talk about that. On Monday it was The Beast Rider Part 1. As we move ever deeper into the last days, the identity of the major players mentioned in the prophecies of these last days become ever more important. The world is going to suffer at the hands of those players and we want to be ready when they come on the scene. Our natural focus is the beast and the antichrist, and I've talked about who and what they are, but there is one entity that I haven't given that much attention to, the beast rider. This is the great whore that rides the beast, and we aren't really sure who she is. The issue of who is the rider of the beast of Revelation has arisen again. On Friday, Rick Wiles told his audience that he was leaving Babylon, the United States, and he interviewed a friend that I and my family have known for more than 30 years, John Price. John and his wife Kathy have been on the sharp end of trying to fix what's wrong with America. I have a tremendous amount of respect for them both, especially since they have been so faithful in responding to God's commands. So when someone like John says that time is up for the U.S., well, you need to pay attention. In 1979, John wrote a book called America at the Crossroads. Unfortunately, America didn't listen and chose the wrong road. So, 30 years later, John wrote The End of America. I wrote a review of the book two years ago, and I highly recommend that you read his book. John has gone on to write three more books, and although I haven't had a chance to read them, I am sure that they are worth buying and reading. You can find his books on Amazon.com. Just look for John Richard Price, and I provide a link in my article. John came to the conclusion that America is Babylon, one of the names of the woman who rides the beast in Revelation 17. Once he realized that, he followed the Lord's command to come out of her by moving to Costa Rica. That command is here, quote, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Revelation 18, verses 4 and 5. If you believe that America is Babylon, then you too must follow John's example and leave 
if you can. I have been telling people for years to leave the United States, but not necessarily because she is the beast writer. I reasoned that my message to leave the United States wouldn't change, no matter how I interpreted Revelation 17, so I didn't bother to get out my magnifying glass and take a closer look at the identity of this beast writer. But maybe it is time to look more closely. If America is the beast rider, then I must reinforce my call to leave the United States with God's command to his people from Revelation. So over the next few days, I will be taking a passage-by-passage -passage look at the beast rider and hopefully give you some way to help you decide who she is and what you must do in response. And if you think that my mind is made up on the issue, think again. This series might be as much for me as it might be for you. On Tuesday, it was Beast Rider, Part 2. The beast that the woman rides is first mentioned in Revelation 11, 7, but only briefly. The beast is then discussed in detail in Chapter 13, but not the Beast Rider. It is only in Chapter 17 that we see the great whore who sits on many waters. As I asked yesterday, the question is about her identity. Who is the Beast Rider? It is interesting to see that there are three different theories as to the identity of this woman. The Roman Catholic Church, the United States of America, Mecca in Saudi Arabia. That last one was as much a surprise to me as it probably is to you, but for those who have come out of Islam and embraced Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, it makes some sense. It is interesting that there is no mention of a beast rider until chapter 17. But when an angel speaks to John about her, he speaks in a way that indicates that John has already seen her, yet we haven't been introduced to her. Interesting. Anyway, here's the beginning of Revelation 17. Quote, and there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither. I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Revelation 17, 1. Of course, the angel may have just assumed that John already knew about the great whore. Now verse 2 adds, quote, With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Revelation 17, 2. Later on in Revelation 17, we learn what the many waters are. Quote, and he said unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Revelation 17:15. So the many waters are peoples, crowds of people, national groups, and languages. It's interesting to see that subdivision Notice there's no mention of kings and kingdoms as a part of these many waters. Also, the word for nations is ethne, or ethnics, and not political boundaries. Now why does God describe this woman as the great whore? That name provides us with quite a bit of information. It indicates her gender. It tells us what she does and why. And it gives us something of a clue as to her origins. Remember that God could have chosen a different symbol for John, but he didn't. He chose a woman. A woman is not a symbol of physical power. Otherwise, God would have chosen a man to represent the beast rider. Notice also what she is not doing. Do you see any reins in the hands of this woman to exert direct control of the beast? No, you do not. So this woman has a passive role as the beast rider. Basically, the beast can toss her off at any moment, and there is nothing that she can do about it. Nor can she make the beast change direction or stop by tugging on any reins. This means that the beast rider is in a precarious position and must cooperate with the beast or get thrown off and eaten. The other part that I want us to take away is her identity as a whore, a prostitute. When you see that symbolism in the Bible, it is always in context with an origin. A whore never starts out as a prostitute. She always begins life in purity before defiling herself. 
By way of example, Israel started out in purity before she prostituted herself and caused God to cast her out. Although in Ezekiel 36 and 37, we see God forgiving her and bringing her back. So I believe that we can say that the great whore had pure beginnings. There is a strong element of a betrayal in her, a betrayal of God, as well as a betrayal of her responsibilities. She was doing something other than what she was made for. The beast, on the other hand, is doing exactly what was intended for it. It came out of the bottomless pit and is behaving as designed. But the beast rider doesn't come out of the bottomless pit. She had holy beginnings, otherwise God would not have called her a whore. And I find that thought to be interesting. On Wednesday, it was Beast Rider, Part 3. We can now start identifying how each of the three main theories about the Beast Rider fit within prophecy. And if anything does not fit, well, that theory has been proven wrong. The Beast Rider has a certain relationship with the world that identifies her. She commits fornication with the kings of the earth. The people of the earth drink the wine of her fornication. She sits on the beast, which is full of the names of blasphemy. She is beautiful and wears luxurious clothing and jewelry, and she carries a golden cup that is full of abomination and filthiness. So let's look at that. We are trying to figure out which of the three main theories fit this great whore that rides the beast. The Roman Catholic Church, the United States of America, Mecca in Saudi Arabia. So let's dive in where we left off yesterday in Revelation 17. Quote, With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Revelation 17, 2. Verse 2 talks about two separate activities with two separate people. Kings, people of the earth. She commits fornication with kings, but you do not need to be a king to fit in the category of king here. These kings symbolize power. At the same time, the great whore also has a connection with the populations that the kings rule over. Remember that she sits on peoples, multitudes, and ethnic groups. And we see in verse 2 that she makes them drink of the wine of her fornication, which I would assume to be the results of her unnatural relationship with their governments. Remember also that her portrayal as a woman means that she is not a symbol of physical power. A woman is actually a symbol of personal weakness. A woman would not be used as a symbol if she had physical power. And we also see this in the fact that she has no power over the beast. She is, at best, a passenger. Now what is the one thing that kings want? Power and the ability to stay in power. Let's see how our three contenders for Beast Rider fit within this. The Catholics are an easy fit here. They have attempted to engage in a relationship with every king and every government on the face of the earth. If you let them in, they will promise to support the right of the government to rule their people. And if you are really nice to them, they will give you access to the best intelligence service that the world has ever known, the Jesuits. Back in August, I wrote, quote, Himmler, the head of the Gestapo, is on record as saying that his feared Nazi secret police were modeled on the Jesuits. The CIA itself recognizes that the Jesuits have the greatest intelligence service in the world. So when I see a Jesuit connection to one of the founders of the CIA, my ears perk up. From The Pre-Tribulation Rapture Lie, Part 3, Jesuit Origins. If you have the Jesuits on your side, you will have quite a secure power base to work from. The problem is that the Jesuits are a double-edged sword, but that is a discussion for another day. Whatever the case, it is quite safe to say that the Catholics have been engaged in unnatural relations with kings all over the world. And the Catholics have forced the peoples of the world to drink up the result of that unnatural relationship. Now, the United States has engaged in activities in a way similar to the Catholic Church. 
they have also engaged with the governments of the world in a host of despicable ways. They've propped up regimes that were corrupt and vile while oppressing governments that they didn't agree with. And if you dared to buck the U.S., you would find a revolution breaking out in your country the next day. If that didn't work, your family members would find themselves executed. I've seen this in action, and it's one of the reasons why I consider the U.S. State Department and the CIA to be two of the most vile governmental organizations in the world. I have friends from both organizations, so I know that there are good people there, but the mid and upper levels are full of the worst examples of humanity. But even though there are similarities between the Catholic Church and America in this relationship with power, it is the Catholics that are the most like a prostitute. But in the area of fornication, this is where America really shines. There is no one on earth better at fornication than America. No one. According to statistics, the U.S. produces 89% of the world's pornography. And I have seen the corrupting influence of America on traditional societies like Taiwan. America has done a huge amount of damage to the traditional values of the Taiwanese, and I despise what America has done to Taiwan. There is nothing that makes me more sick than seeing American culture destroy the morals of a society like Taiwan. I love the Taiwanese, and it breaks my heart to see them chase after America and Americans. We have destroyed this beautiful people, and I am sure that this is but one of many examples of a despicable and vile evil perpetrated by an American assault on morality worldwide. When it comes to corrupting the world, nobody beats America. So the next time you want to talk about how America is number one, think about what she is the absolute best at. We truly deserve to be destroyed for what we have done. However, when it comes to Islam and Saudi Arabia, there seems to be a much weaker connection to the idea of the great whore. I'm really struggling to see Mecca's corrupting influence in the world. Yes, I know that Saudi Arabia has been handing out free textbooks to U.S. public schools and building mosques around the world, and, well, I guess that this is a kind of corrupting influence, but this is more in the form of a set up for an attack on the governments of the world. It's hard to see that these are the activities of a prostitute. I do know that very religious Muslims view the Saudi government as incredibly corrupt, but what the Saudis and other Arab governments are doing doesn't really seem out of character for what governments tend to do as a normal course of doing business. Also, Mecca doesn't have the individual connection to the populations of the world like America and the Vatican. They certainly have a big impact for Muslim populations, but not so much the non-Muslim ones. Whereas for America and the Vatican, there are no barriers to their corrupting influence. But there is enough of a similarity that I would be willing to allow the Mecca theory to still stay in the race. However, the Mecca theory is a distant third in this rather tawdry competition. On Thursday was Beast Rider, Part 4. We continue to make our way slowly through Revelation 17, comparing the Beast Rider to what we see in the world today. Yesterday we saw her relationship with the kings of this world, as well as her direct relationship with the inhabitants of the earth. Today we will talk about her relationship with the Beast and her appearance. By the way, of the three theories that we are examining, remember that what is not a part of the great whore is actually a part of the beast. What is not the rider is the beast. We are trying to figure out which of the three main theories fit this great whore that rides the beast. The Roman Catholic Church, the United States of America, Mecca in Saudi Arabia. Mecca is looking like a distant third right now, while the U.S. and the Roman Catholic Church appear to be neck and neck. Will it be a photo finish? We'll see. So let's dive in where we left off yesterday in Revelation 17. Quote, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names 
of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Revelation 17, verses 3 and 4. This is where I think that we have a little more to work with. I think that we have an idea of what this beast is. It's a satanic Babylonian power and mysticism that goes back to the beginning of time. The idea of becoming a god, equal to God, is at the center of what the beast is, although we are skipping over a host of detail when we describe the beast so simply. The great whore is separate from the beast and cooperates with it, but she is not a part of the beast. I think that is crucial to remember as we try to identify her. As we did yesterday, let's start with the Roman Catholic Church. Those of us who have been uncovering the massive number of crimes perpetrated by the Roman Catholic Church, we are shocked at just how vile and evil she is. The Catholics have been engaged in every vile and filthy evil there is. The Vatican really is one of the most repugnant organizations that has ever been created. So it is little wonder that our brethren of ages gone by would label her the Beast, or at least the Antichrist, and she could very well be all that. However, we've seen the rise of another hand in human affairs that is far more secretive and vile than even the Catholics. We call them the Banksters and the Illuminati, and while they are not a part of the Roman Catholic Church in any way, they do have a relationship with her. In fact, the Jesuits even had a hand in assisting the Bavarian arm of the Illuminati in their formation, and it is the Jesuits that appear to have been the main facilitators of the connection between the Vatican and the Illuminated Ones. So if I had to decide whether the Vatican was a part of the beast or whether she was the whore, I would lean towards her being the whore. The Vatican is certainly beautiful. She has a beauty that appeals to people anywhere and everywhere. And I believe that part of that beauty comes from her holy beginnings, from the churches at Rome that chose to corrupt themselves rather than stick to the truth of God. Yes, there is some truth to be found in the Roman Catholic Church. Not a lot. Some. Of course, it doesn't take a lot of truth to endow a lie with beauty and power. And as I have described, she is full of abominations, filthiness, and great cruelty. When Meyer Amschel Rothschild wanted to get a secret society started, he went to the perfect person, a Jesuit priest, Adam Weishaupt. The Catholics kept all the records about Babylonian mysticism and occult magic. They had everything that you needed to know about being a good Satanist, and Weishaupt handed it over to the Illuminati. And if the Catholics are the great whore, then her beauty and the golden cup that she holds is a part of her Christian beginnings. But that cup holds true abomination. This is where I believe the America begins to lose the race with the Catholics for being the great whore. I'm not saying that she's out of the running here, but in comparison to the Vatican, I'm just not sure that America has the same sex appeal that the Vatican has, at least in comparison to the thousand plus years that the Vatican has been around. Of course, I'm not saying that America isn't beautiful. Everyone, everywhere around the world wants some kind of connection with the U.S. No other country in the world has the same kind of magnetism as America. For most of my 19 years in Asia, people would look at me and wonder why I wasn't back in the place that they wanted to be. Only now has America's appeal started to dim. Fewer and fewer people are wondering why I am in Taiwan or Israel instead of Indiana. I also have a mixed view of America's origins. There are some who make a big deal about the Christian origins of America, but most of what they say just isn't true. These great architects of the American political system were not Christian. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin. None of those men were Christian. They may have referenced God and talked about God, but they did not follow God. Of this, I am completely certain. The rest of the founding fathers of America were something of a mixed bag. 
Many were clearly not Christian. Some may or may not have been. It's hard to say. And if you want confirmation of America's unchristian beginnings, you need only look at the architecture and layout of America's capital. Babylonian mysticism and Greco-Roman mythology are everywhere. There are few places in America that are less Christian than Washington, D.C. And it was designed that way from the beginning. In fact, I believe that America has had a vital and important role in the rise of the beast system that we see today. She has become a part of the beast, not just writing it. But I also cannot escape America's role in bringing the light of the gospel to the farthest reaches of the world. And she also acted as a refuge to those seeking to escape religious persecution in Europe. The light of Christ found a home in the United States, which is why I believe that God has withheld his judgment upon her. But I believe that the golden cup of her corruption is full, and America is ready for the judgment of God. Quote, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? 1 Peter 4, 17 Is America the great whore? I'm not sure. We'll see. I'm afraid that Islam, Mecca, and Saudi Arabia are falling farther and farther behind. It is hard for me to see how she can compete with either the Roman Catholic Church or America in terms of beauty and corruption. Yes, there is much that is attractive about Islam, and many are attracted to that awful religion, but many, many more are repulsed by her. Remember also that we are looking at the great whore through the eyes of John. John was the one who thought the great whore as amazing and beautiful, and I seriously doubt that John would feel the same way about Islam even Mecca or Saudi Arabia. But it will be the next two verses that will show us who is who. On Friday, it was Beast Rider, Part 5. Today we bring this discussion to a close. Hopefully, I will have laid out the pieces of the puzzle in such a way that you can decide for yourself who the Beast Rider is and by process of elimination who the Beast is. Yesterday we talked about her relationship with the beast and the richness of her apparel and the fact that she holds in her hand a golden cup full of abomination. Today we talk about the names on her forehead, the fact that she is a city and that all who are a part of her are commanded by God to leave her. We are trying to figure out which of the three main theories fit this great whore that rides the beast the Roman Catholic Church, the United States of America, Mecca in Saudi Arabia. The Meccan theory isn't looking good at this point. Yesterday, the Roman Catholic Church pulled ahead of the U.S., so we'll see who passes the finish line as winner of the dubious prize of Great Whore. Of course, those that are not a part of the Great Whore are obviously a part of the Beast, which would actually be worse. Here are the final scriptures that deal with the great whore. Quote, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Revelation 17, 5 and 6. Quote, And here is the mind which hath wisdom, the seven heads or seven mountains, on which the woman sitteth. Revelation 17, 9. Quote, And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues, and the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Revelation 17, verses 15 and 16. Quote, And the woman which thou sawest is the great city, which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Revelation 17, 18. Chapter 18 deals specifically with the great whore, but I want to include all of that here, 
All of it is important to read, but here are the most important verses. Quote, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Revelation 18.4 And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. Revelation 18.11 And saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour so great riches is come to naught. And every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? Revelation 18, verses 16 through 18. Quote, and a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city, Babylon, be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. Revelation 18.21 Quote, And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Revelation 18.24 And then there is this verse in chapter 19. Quote, for true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. Revelation 19, 2. There is a fantastic celebration over the destruction of this city in chapter 19. So the question is this, which of the three theories fits best with what we see here? Here are the attributes. Mystery and Babylon the Great, Mother of Harlots, she sits on peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. The ten horns hate her. She is a great city. She reigns over the kings of the earth. God's people are in her. The merchants of the earth mourn over her destruction. She has murdered God's people, and she is drunk with their blood. Her death is so wonderful that heaven rejoices at it. Okay, so let's try to put all this together. Like the previous days, we'll start with the traditional nominee, the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church fits all of these attributes, and she fits them extremely well. She embodies the mysteries of the Babylonian occult and has incorporated them into her ceremonies. She has also preserved them in her archives and used them to their fullest extent. She has harlot daughters. Take a good hard look at the Protestant churches and you'll find that they are very much like their mother. And we see the harlot daughters being drawn back to their mother church. By the way, Baptists are not Protestants. She is hated by the kings of the earth, even though they deal with her. She is also a great city. This city has been around for a very, very long time, and there are few cities that are more impressive than Rome. And when God calls his people out of her, I don't believe that this is a command to leave a geographical location, although I admit that this could be what God is doing. The merchants of the earth certainly would mourn over her destruction. And if there is one thing that you can say about the Roman Catholic Church is that she has murdered God's people. No one and I mean no one, has murdered more of God's people than the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church is the greatest murderer of God's people that the world has ever known. Furthermore, she is also one of the great corruptors of God's church, sending her secret emissaries in to change seminaries and destroy pastors and churches. Her Jesuits have crept into many, many places and defiled many teachings. My own studies in this area have uncovered a mountain of crime and villainy that is breathtaking. As I have said before and will continue to say, the Roman Catholic Church is the most vile organization on earth. It is hard to think of anything more hypocritical and more evil than she is. So the question that you need to ask yourself, is she the great whore or is she the beast? But let's move on to our next contestant. Most of you don't realize that Babylonian mysticism is woven throughout America's beginnings. 
It's on the great seal of the United States. It's in the layout of Washington, D.C., and her founders were all acolytes of the deepest mysteries of Babylonianism. Steve Quayle has even brought out the origins of the name America as mystical and of an occult nature. But can we say that she is the mother of harlots? That is one of many attributes to the great whore that troubles me when I try to apply this to the U.S. of A. I can understand how her culture has gained power with the people of the world and that she sits astride seven mountains, i.e. seven continents. I can see how she reigns over the kings of the earth. In fact, for a world system to be created, everyone has acknowledged that America must be destroyed. America cannot exist as a great power if a world system is to rise to take over the world. I can also see that God's people are in America and that no one has corrupted the world more than America has. I can see how the merchants of the world would mourn at her destruction. But, and I'm having trouble here, how has she murdered the people of God? Yes, I'm sure that a close look at America will reveal the unjustified killing of many of God's people. But when you compare the U.S. to the Vatican, well, there's no comparison. Add to this the question of who the harlot daughters of America are, and, well, you have something of a conundrum. Also, we have something of a problem with the idea of America being a city. Of course, we could claim this to be New York City, and much blame could be laid at the feet of New York City, but if you focus everything on New York City, it reduces even further the blame that you can attribute to her. For instance, it is Los Angeles that is the center of the world's pornography and movie business. And let me add that America and New York are very, very young, and their power and corruption are younger still. With such a short period of time to corrupt the world, would heaven be involved in such rejoicing as is described in chapter 19? I mean, the great whore is singled out for special attention. The world power of the United States dates back maybe a hundred years, if that. And throughout all this time, America has been involved in spreading the gospel. Is America corrupting the gospel as well? Yes, but not like the Roman Catholic Church. To my own mind, I would have to consider America to be in second place behind the Roman Catholic Church to be the great whore. But there is one way that America could be the great whore if the Roman Catholic Church was a part of the beast. That would certainly be how America could be the great whore. Now, Mecca does shine a bit in the area of murdering God's people. They have certainly done a lot of it over the past 1,400 years. But the Muslims haven't murdered as many Christians as the Catholics have. Furthermore, I'm not sure that we can call her the mother of harlots, or that the merchants of the world would mourn so much over her destruction. Yes, I understand how some would see how she fits with these descriptions, but in my spirit I just cannot see how they fit that well. To make Mecca and Islam fit in with the great whore, you would need to get out your hammer and bang on the pieces to wedge them in. Although I will say that Mecca and Islam have been around for far longer than America, and one could claim that they have a far greater claim to being the great whore but I still see Mecca as being in third place. Things will need to change drastically for her to reach a place where I would change my opinion about this. Of course, drastic change is coming, so anything is possible. In my opinion, and yes, it is only my opinion, the Roman Catholic Church still holds the pride of place in this race. She still seems to fit the role of great whore better than any other. But there is one caveat here. She is the great whore only if she is not the beast, or a part of the beast. Our ancient brethren for more than a thousand years have called her the beast, and I value their opinion greatly. So if you claim that the Roman Catholic Church is a part of the beast, then America is the great whore. This is an interesting thought, but I'm not sure that this works. But if you accept this as true, then, well, you have a problem. Why? Because God has commanded his people to leave her. It is not a suggestion, so you had better get out. Now. And for Mecca and Islam, I can only say that those voting for them to be the great whore 
Well, nice try. But it just doesn't work. Mecca and Islam do not have holy beginnings and are just like the many religious cults that were successful. I hope that this was helpful to you. I pray that the Holy Spirit directs your thoughts on this. This issue is one of the more difficult to address. However, I believe that the coming days, weeks, months, and years will make it clear to us who the great whore is and who is the beast. I truly hope that you'll be ready for this. That's a link. There's not much time left. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. Proverbs 22, 3. This has been the Weekend Shotcast for Saturday, November 22nd, 2014. I'm John Little of OmegaShock.com, and I hope you have a good one.